Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is a lecture for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development at Utah Valley University. In this video, we're going to be looking at Chapter 7, which is on early adulthood. Now, there's a longer version of this that you can download uh, from the link on the website, but this is the abbreviated version that especially emphasizes the material that's on the exam. The first thing we want to talk about is health and fitness, and uh, most specifically that um, obesity has is a bigger and bigger problem, more of an issue in the United States. We talked about it before with childhood, saying that in the United States in particular, people were susceptible to the, to the diseases of affluence or uh, the diseases of wealth. Sorry, I can't talk well. Um, and what we have here is this little statistic that 40% of the people between 18 and 24, so college students, um, are overweight or obese. Um, and that's on the other hand, what's funny about that is that 40% is lower than the 67% of the general population between 20 to 74 that's obese. Two-thirds of the general population in the U.S. are obese, but a little less than half of those in uh, college age. Now, there's a lot of things that go into it, biological and uh, physiological factors uh, involved. Something called adaptive thermogenesis that makes the body burn calories more slowly when dieting, so it's harder to lose weight. Also, a person with high fat to muscle ratio, they metabolize the food more slowly than a person of the same weight with more muscle, so it's, it makes it easier to gain weight and harder to lose, but I think most of us knew that anyhow. All right, sexuality. Sexual activity, uh, not surprisingly, uh, well, sex with a partner usually peaks in the early 20s. And one of the interesting things about it is that people... Um, with higher levels of education tend to have more sex partners. Um, and so the I, you know, I was not aware of that, but um, what the book tells us is that partly this could be due to education as a liberalizing influence. Uh, so you, people with high levels of education are less likely to subscribe to conventional norms of uh, sexual behavior. And also, um, simply being around more people, exposure to more potential partners um, in a campus environment. So things that you may be aware of already. Okay. Um, about 7% of American women and men define themselves as being something other than heterosexual. That's what we got here on the slide. Um, I've heard numbers that were slightly higher for men and slightly lower for women, but um, let's take that as a rough estimate. Um, theories about sexual orientation involve both nature and nurture, so the biological makeup of the individual and uh, some significant environmental influences. So, for instance, in terms of uh, nurture, so learning theorists um, who talk about um, reinforcement and contingencies, they talk about things like, um, well, the behavior with members of one's own sex and possibly childhood sexual abuse can shape uh, same gender sexuality. On the other hand, a lot of critics, um, you know, take exception to this and say that most people become aware of their sexual orientation long before they have sexual contact with either sex. So that one may not hold much water. Also, um, in terms of biology, uh, some evidence exists for genetic factors in sexual orientation. So, for instance, twin studies have shown that fifty per uh, fifty-two percent of identical twin pairs are in agreement or have a concordance rate for gay male sexual orientation. So if you have identical twins uh, who are male and one of them is uh, gay, 52% of the time, about half the time, the other one will also be gay. It's not 100%, it's, but it's higher than the 22% concordance rate you get for fraternal twins uh, when they're both male. So there's a, that's a big difference between the two. Also, there's the interesting theory from evolutionary psychology that same-gender sexual behavior uh, might be supported in a natural selection uh, way um, for mutual unselfish concern. So, for instance, um, the book tells us that strong same-sex relationships can actually serve to increase group survival by binding a group together emotionally. That's an interesting thing. Um, and it goes against some of the naive assumptions that, you know, if a gay and lesbian major doesn't have kids, then any genetic influence is going to wipe it out. No, because there's a lot of indirect influences through something called inclusive fitness. Okay. 
Uh, sexual harassment, it's everywhere. It's in colleges and work, military, online, everywhere. Um, now, there are legal definitions of sexual harassment, such as deliberate or repeated unwanted comments, gesture, or physical contact. And then, you know, there's the, there's the more, in terms of how a person actually feels, that's different from a legal situation. Um, somewhere around half of all working women and female college students, you know, between 40 and 60%, about half, uh, have been victims of sexual harassment. And the big part of the problem is that accusations of sexual harassment are frequently ignored or they're, they're uh, played down by coworkers and employers, especially when it comes to a he said, she said kind of thing, um, which is just kind of perpetuates the victimization and makes it easier for offenders in the future. Um, on a separate note, I thought I would mention something else about sexuality. Um, Educational programs about STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Um, so what's interesting about this is these are in high schools. Parents are encouraged to talk to their kids about uh, STIs. And so kids get all this information. And what's interesting is how many kids actually modify, change their sexual practices once they've received the information about sexually transmitted infections. And the, and the answer is only 50%. You, you would hope that all of them would, but about 50% change uh, what they do. All right, next one in the make-believe college classroom with the two guys talking to each other while the women look on admiringly. Um, Perry's theory of epistemic cognition. So William Perry uh, talked about the ideas that people have, how they arrive at their beliefs and uh, sort of well, their value structure. And so in college, that's an interesting time because this is early adulthood and and people may seek to either validate or revise their own ideals, their beliefs about what's right or wrong or what they should do. And the research says a lot of it's not just because you're reading books. Um, so, for instance, you may read, you know, philosophy or you may read some literature that talks about this a lot. But a lot of it is simply the exposure to uh, other students and to uh, teachers who have different beliefs than their own. Hopefully it's done in a situation where there is room for variability. Not everybody has to agree on everything, but you can discuss things in a respectful format. All right, more about his theory. Um, Perry also talked about what was called dualistic thinking and relativistic thinking. And dualistic thinking, which is something that characterizes people who are younger, um, it's just the division of good people, bad people, good things, bad things, and it also usually corresponds to me, or us, which is good, and them, which is bad. And um, that if only the bad people would see that you were better, they would be like you and everything would be wonderful. Well, you know, you don't you don't convince a whole lot of people with that kind of thinking. And one of the things that happens as people go through college in particular is the development of relativistic thinking. And that's the idea that the things that you see as good or bad or you see that they can be strongly influenced by your belief system or by your cultural background, that there, there's a major social influence to them, and that what might be considered good or bad could change depending on the time or place um, that a person is in. Okay, college and cognitive development. So um, here we have that the STEM fields, that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, more men go into it than women do. Uh, while women are uh, earning more and more of the degrees in college. And so there's the issue of a lot of people really want to find out what they can do to get more uh, girls um, at very young ages and, and women in college to be interested in the STEM fields. Anyhow, uh, college can contribute to cognitive development in many ways. So for instance, uh, the diversity that you can experience while in college, that can positively influence the cognitive development, can promote it can promote the advancement of writing proficiency, speaking skills, critical thinking. I certainly hope it would. Also, um, it can involve analyzing and questioning uh, statements, arguments from others to form your own explanations and conclusions. And also, you can develop something called cognitive affective complexity. And what that means is the way that you think about something may be at odds with the way that you feel about it. And uh, a person can actually get a situation where they're willing to let those conflicting uh, thoughts and feelings um, you know, abide with each other, uh, realizing that's just kind of the way it is, um, instead of wanting everything to be either all positive or all negative. Um, and again, it, it gets at what has, in different situations, been called negative capability. 
the ability to let conflicting uh, thoughts or feelings um, inhabit your mind simultaneously. But, you know, that's a different issue. All right. Career development. So work's a major part of life and early adulthood. So college students, a time when most of us become established in our careers. So things like wages, fringe benefits, future security, these are extrinsic reasons for being employed. Extrinsic means, you know, what you get out of it. Um, um, also, you get this thing about idleness, so not wanting to work, sit around, um, seen as morally unacceptable by a lot of people. So a good work ethic um, is an intrinsic motivation for working, along with the need for self-identity and socialization. Um, also, the this, this same the simple idea that a person's self-worth um, is strongly influenced by the recognition and respect for a job well done that contributes to their self-esteem. In fact, it's often seen as synonymous with self-worth. Okay, career development. So uh, David Super has a theory of career development it's broken down into four stages. The first is the fantasy stage from very early childhood to maybe 11 years old, where you focus on things that are exciting or glamorous. So that could be acting or sports or medicine or law enforcement. And people say they want to do those despite really their own preferences or abilities. It just, you know, it looks cool. Um, then around 11 through high school, uh, Super describes what he calls the tentative choice stage. So this is where you start to look at interests, abilities, and limitations, but glamour is still a part of it. And then after 17, the realistic choice stage. And this is where comparisons are made between the requirements of the job and the rewards and how they relate to the person's interests, abilities, and values. And so, you know, people may start to hopefully go towards things that they're actually more interested and qualified in, or they um, may hop around. And choices become narrowed by weighing the job requirements and rewards, again, to emphasize against interests, abilities, and values. That is the realistic choice stage. There's also a maintenance stage, and this is when you have your career and maybe you maintain through the same thing. And then the retirement stage at the end when you quit working and got to watch out for boredom. And a lot of people actually take second or third jobs during that. All right, another factor here, um, separation versus individuation. So young adults leave home at different ages and for different reasons. Those who enter the job market often find themselves uh, living with roommates in poorer neighborhoods or with their parents, that happens more often around here until they have enough money to move out. They may go to college, enlist in the military, may get married, um, anyhow. Um, one of the interesting things is the process of individuation, as defined in our textbook, it's, it's counterintuitive, it may not be what you think it is. Our book defines individuation as an early adult's process of becoming an individual, fine, by means of integrating his or her own values and beliefs, fine, with those of her parents, uh, his or her parents or society at large. So what's interesting is it, it's, it's talking about you, how you actually are placing yourself in a coherent um, relationship with the people around you, which I wouldn't have thought as being a part of individuation, but it's individuation within a social context. And it sounds like with respect or deference to that social context. Uh, also, just one other thing here about uh, moving out. Young adults are more likely to feel connected to their parents if they're receiving financial and emotional support from them. So um, just something to consider. All right, intimacy versus isolation. And um, this is where we get at Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. So for instance, uh, during the young adult phase, this is Erickson's stage of intimacy versus isolation. And it's a time when a person uh, forms an intimate relationship with a significant other. So boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, something like that. Um, or risks following the pathway towards social isolation. And um, it's also a time you've, you know, you've formed your identity during adolescence and now you're ready to sort of engage with others um, and sort of blending the personality through marriage and friendship. Um, and then people who don't attempt to develop intimate relationships, well, you know, there's a risk of being isolated and lonely, the book tells us, surprisingly. On the other hand, um, a lot of people get married. One of the interesting statistics is that 83%, so over four out of five, uh, men and women choose to marry partners within five years of their own age. And that's uh, an example of what's called homogamy. And that means uh, marriage of similars. Um, and it's a very common practice here. And, um, you know, there are exceptions. 
but most people marry people relatively close to their own age. All right. Seasons of life. So this is Daniel Levinson and suggested there's, he talks about what's called a life structure or an underlying pattern of a person's life at any given stage. And it's defined by relationships, career, race and ethnicity, religion, economic status, and other things. Again, the life structure is just the underlying pattern of a person's life at any given time. And uh, he said, for instance, uh, this is David Levinson, excuse me, um, Daniel Levinson. Many young adults adopt what he calls the dream or the desire to leave their mark on the world, which serves as a tentative blueprint for their lives. Um, you know, in their 20s, people marked by ambition. Those in the 20s or 30s reevaluating their lives. Uh, he calls, Levinson called it the age 30 transition. By 30s, most were settling down their roots. Now, uh, just one other thing about the dream. A lot of times, it's, it's the idea that you're going to go out there and you're going to totally change the world. And, you know, you'll have more than your 15 minutes of fame. And obviously, this can and does happen for a certain number of people, but for most, it doesn't. And so it kind of gets back to uh, the career ambition stuff that we talked about earlier. All right, next item here, uh, attraction and love. Well, this is where we get back to the idea of homogamy. People tend to uh, pair up with people who are similar to them, and not just in age, but in a lot of things. Um, so, for instance... Uh, we have the attraction similarity hypothesis. That uh, people uh, tend to develop romantic relationships with those who are similar to themselves in physical attractiveness and a whole lot of other traits. Um, also, um, the idea of just general reciprocity. So, you know, um, if you feel admired or complimented somebody, you tend to return those feelings and behaviors. That's you know, that's reciprocal behavior, and it's a big part of establishing relationships through this kind of similarity. All right, the next one is um, Robert Sternberg's little triarchic theory, uh, his little triangle theory of love. And what's interesting about this is he talks about three factors that go into it. He talks about intimacy, passion, and commitment. And he calls it a triangular theory. And the idea here is that a good match occurs when there is a balance of commitment, intimacy, and passion. Otherwise, you risk getting some of these uh, unusual things like um, empty love or infatuation or, you know, fatuous love at the bottom is my favorite. Um, and so he also talks about not just the balance, but the absolute size. You can have a really small triangle, but it's a, or a really big triangle. And so it's neat to take a closer look at Sternberg's theory and think about how your own relationships might fit into that one. All right, good old marriage. Most uh, people in their uh, 30s and 40s, 35 to 44 years old, most of them still get married. And it is absolutely true that nationwide support for gay marriage is on the upswing. It's becoming uh, legal in more states. The bans against it are, more of them are getting ruled unconstitutional and there's uh, general support for it uh, more often. Now, um, what do I have to say about this? I've mentioned the term homogamy before. Now, homogamy does not mean gay marriage. That's a different thing. That's uh, same-sex marriage. Homogamy means uh, choosing a spouse who is similar to you, meaning like same religion, same ethnicity, same in many, many ways. Um, I do want to say one thing about same-sex marriage, and not surprisingly, there's research that says that uh, same-sex couples experience uh, more satisfaction when social supports are present, when you're supported by other people, when the existence of your relationship is validated by others, you tend to, you know, be happier about things. And so that, that should make common sense, but there's also research to support it. All right. Last one, parenthood. Um, becoming a parent is a major life event that requires changes in nearly every aspect of life, personal, social, financial, and, um, Many people are marrying at an older age. Many women are having children later in life. And, um, you know, on the other hand, many single parents work and live uh, and learn to live on one income. It's very demanding. On the other hand, children who are raised in single parent homes uh, learn to assume responsibilities at a younger age than kids that are growing up in a two parent family, you know, is sort of contributing to it. Anyhow, there's a lot more that could be said about this. I just wanted to focus on the key aspects that are going to show up in the exam and things that you would really want to focus on as you're reading through the textbook and preparing for the course. 
Anyhow, that's the end of this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in class.